Jaya Sriman Narayana Jaya Bhagavan Shri Krishna Jaya Shri Guru Sanatana Dharma Jayate Dharma Rashtra Jayate Suryavansha Jayate Om Hari Om Namaste, everyone. It is absolutely my privilege and my honor to be with you this evening for our Monday live stream satsangha. And what we're going to be doing today is the continuation of what we have been doing for the last two live streams, and that is the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And we will be looking at spe specifically the only writing that he has that he ever produced, which is the Shikshashtakam. And uh, again, the only writing, it's only eight verses, and even though small in quantity, in quality, unmatched, absolutely unmatched in, uh, in both the, uh, poetic, uh, the poetic aspect of what he wrote in Sanskrit, as well as just the spiritual profundity, the, the devotional profundity <clears throat> of what he wrote. So we'll be looking at the last two of his, of his verses. We looked at all the rest, uh, again, the previous two live streams, and we'll finish up today. Before we do that, however, I just want to say a few things before we begin. There has been rumor going around that the International Sanatana Dharma Society was going to have a conference last weekend. Well, that rumor was true. <laughs> it was an invitation-only conference for our members. And it was not open to the public at all, so we did not uh, announce it publicly in, in any way. It was exclusively for individuals who are 100% committed to the International Sanatana Dharma Society, and very specifically, how we teach Sanatana Dharma, i.e. 100% authentically. So this conference went on the 13th and the 14th, that is, again, this last Saturday and Sunday, uh, people began arriving as early as Thursday. People left as late as today, actually. There was uh, one last person who left uh, er this morning uh, and drove back many, many states away to his home. So, indeed, uh, there were quite a few people who were here in Omaha. And the conference itself was the very best conference we have ever had, both in terms of quality and quantity. Uh, we had many, many people in attendance. There were a total at the height of it of 60 people approximately uh, who were attending the conference and uh, the quality of the conference was like nothing we had ever done before. We had international speakers, we had people who were both here in in Omaha at our temple who did presentations, we had people also from several nations throughout the world uh, who also gave talks and those talks uh, were conveyed to us through Zoom and again, the quality of everything was absolutely wonderful and amazing. In addition to the official, uh, the official program that occurred with the conference itself, uh, people, in addition to that, just being together, hanging out, taking uh, tours of Omaha, etc., doing things like going out to eat and just being with each other, associating with each other, getting to meet new people, make new friends, etc., it was wonderful and beautiful in every way. Uh, not only have I not heard anything negative about anything that happened <laughs> with the conference, uh, not even close. Uh, most people who have spoken about the conference, it seems like they just can't, can't stop uh, going on about how truly wonderful it was. 
And again, the most uh, wondrous thing was the association, the individuals who uh, many of them knew each other online. They knew each other's names either here on on uh, YouTube or through the Discord channel or in other ways, but they had never actually met face to face to the point where they could literally kind of touch each other if they wanted to. Well, that happened for many people uh, this last weekend. And again, friendships were made that I know will last forever. <clears throat> now, how does one become involved in an ISDS conference? You have to be involved in the ISDS. You have to be a serious person. You have to be a member. You have to be someone who we know extremely well, and we know that you're serious. We know that you're sincere. We know that you're not playing games, but that indeed you understand Sanatana Dharma for what it truly is. You want to practice it and understand it authentically and sincerely so. And again, you are committed to the ISDS. So thus, for example, every member, every monthly tithing member was invited to this conference. And many other well-wishers were invited as well. So if indeed you want to be invited to a conference at some time in the future, become very active in the ISDS. Become a supporter of the ISDS, a serious supporter. You know, practice our practices, practice our sadhana, learn our philosophy, etc., and once that is the case, indeed, you will receive very miraculously a invitation for the next conference that will occur. This is a yearly conference. Uh, this last one was the eighth that we've had of yearly conferences. So it's gone on for eight years. And these conferences will continue to go on for many, many years to come. And they will always be in the Vedic heartland. They will always be here in Omaha, nowhere else. We used to have conferences sometimes in a different city or here or there. Uh, in the future, every single conference will be here in our Vedic heartland and focused around our main temple here. So this is what happened this previous weekend. And again, it was absolutely wondrous for everyone who was here. So with that, the very last thing that I'm going to say, and this will be absolute this will be very very brief and that is that we were indeed doing a uh, somewhat informal two-week membership drive for the International Sanatana Dharma Society. It began on the first and even though it's slightly over two weeks now this is the first opportunity I've had to do a live stream marking the end of this. So again just to let people know if indeed you would like to become a member, an official monthly tithing member of the International Sanatana Dharma Society. As, as you can see from what I just said about the conference, there are many benefits to, to be had, including access to monthly private live streams where I simply answer questions from all of our members. This is not something that's available to the public, including, indeed, you get invitations to the conference and other things like that behind the scenes that you have access to with the ISDS but only if you become a member of the ISDS. To do that, you simply go to dharmacentral.com, you look on the menu, and you'll see membership, and uh, it's, very, it's a very quick thing. It would take about 90 seconds to become a member of the ISDS. And in that way, the most important thing of all, even more important than um, exclusive uh, Q&As with me or conferences or anything like that, the most important thing is that with that monthly donation, whatever it is, $5, $500 a month, whatever it is, you are helping the ISDS and you're helping me to restore Dharma to this world. So I thank you for considering becoming a member of the ISDS. And with that, now let us dive into the last two verses of the Shikshashtakam that we still have to look at, and this will then complete this three three part series that we have been doing. <clears throat> so first we're going to look at Shikshashtakam and verse seven. So this is seven and I will read it to everyone now. Oh Govinda, feeling at your separation, I am considering a moment to be like twelve years or more. Tears are flowing from my eyes like torrents of rain and I am feeling all vacant in the world in your absence. Very nice. So to repeat again, these verses were written by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, one of the greatest sages, greatest saints, greatest gurus, greatest acharyas in the history of Sanatana Dharma. He 
Uh, he lived, he thrived approximately 500 years ago, more or less. And uh, again, there is not enough that can, be said, that can be said about the exalted nature of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And these are the only things that he wrote, even though he himself was a scholar, he himself was a logician. So he was a philosopher. He was someone who knew the scriptures, obviously extremely well, that's putting it lightly. He was someone who, more than anything, <clears throat> he was an accomplished bhakta. And despite all of this, again, he only wrote these eight verses. But when we read these verses, we see the pure spirit of bhakti, of devotion towards Sri Krishna coming through. And again, this is one of the main things that we see. What we see are three things, really. And last time I mentioned two things. I wanted to wait until we got to these last two verses. We see three things. First of all, we see tremendous humility on his part. And indeed, he teaches us humility, not just by giving us a, a straightforward lesson, oh, this is what it means to be uh, humble, you do A, B, C, and D. No, not in a systematic way like that, but more importantly, more effectively, he shows us through his words what it means to have humility. So indeed, when we read all eight of these verses, we see someone who, despite his exalted nature, despite the fact that, oh, again, he was a philosopher and he had millions of followers, etc., etc., he had a humility that is incomparable. So this is one of the first things that we see. The other thing that we see, not so much in the verses we're going to look at now, but previous verses, is the emphasis on the holy name of God, on meditating upon chanting the holy names of God and how we are to take shelter of the names of God and how we are to chant the names of God. And again, interestingly, not in a technical sense, but rather showing the mood with which one should recite the names of God. The third thing that we see, which I'll speak of now, is indeed bhakti itself. What is the mood of an individual who is truly in love with Krishna, truly in love with God? You know, it's, it's interesting. I always choose my words carefully as putting it very lightly. In love with God. We see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu being in love with God. We hear about love of God all the time. Uh, or oh, even in Christianity, again, even among the circles of some Christian mystics, they'll talk about love of God. Oh, we are to love God. You'll hear this in many different places, different contexts. But I'm using my words very carefully. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu teaches us how to be in love with God. Now, what does this mean? Well, even from the material perspective, we know there are many different kinds of love. You know, there are some people who will say, oh, I love my cell phone, I love my iPhone. <laughs> you know, the word love is used for everything. I love orange juice, I love this, I love that, or I love this person, that person, etc. Well, one of the greatest, that is the most intense, the most, the most vibrant, the, the, most, uh, the most impactful forms of love that we can have is when we are indeed in love. This is why, if you look at the history of world literature, if you look at lyrics of poetry, so many stories that take place, if you look even today at movies, at so many movies that come out, oh, at, uh, at music, you know, just modern music, at the lyrics, what do you find again and again and again? You find this concept of falling in love, being in love, finding your, your, the perfect person for you, etc., etc., this is a, a universal that we find among all humans. Not merely to love, but to be in love. So this being the case, we have to understand that, of course, when speaking about that, that which is the highest, when speaking about, about God himself, we can and should, if we are capable, we should also speak in these terms of being in love with God. To love God, oh, that is the greatest of things. Certainly, to love God, to love God for God's own sake, that is, that is e even greater. But what does it mean to be in love with God? This is another stage of love, even love of God, that is something that makes all other forms of love, even general loves of God, pale, pale in comparison. And why is this the case? Well, 
let's say you're a young child, whatever, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old, something like that, and you love your parents. And let's say specifically you love your father. Well, that's, that's a very virtuous sort of love. But you see how there's still somewhat of a barrier that's there. There's still somewhat of an official capacity that you don't cross beyond. In other words, oh, you are, of course, of necessity, very respectful to your father, very formal with your father, etc. <clears throat> and not just due to, oh, you're afraid you're going to be punished. No, deeper than that. Because, ideally speaking, your father should be someone who is worthy of respect because of who he is, because he's a virtuous person. So as a result, yes, you have that respect that's there, such that while there is love, there is still somewhat of a distance that's there. Now, when you are in love with your beloved, oh, now it's a, a much more different sort of love, where that barrier is gone, and you can love your beloved in a very close, very intimate sort of way. And rather than say, oh, yes, yes, father, yes, mother, etc., oh, now you call your, your beloved by not just the first name, nicknames even. <laughs> you know, there's an, a level of intimacy that is there where it's a higher form of love, where this is someone where you know, ideally, again, the ideal, this is someone who is your best friend in the world. This is someone who you can share everything with. This is someone who knows you better than everyone. You know, other people may think they, they know you. They don't know you as well as that person who is your partner and vice versa. So there is an intimacy that is there when you are in love versus simply loving someone. Now, this is what is amazing is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is writing in this mood of one who is in love with God and for whom that love is described sometimes even in ways which, again, if you have been in love, in a good relationship, that is, you know, reciprocal relationship, you're in love with someone, they're in love with you. Um, we can understand what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is explaining here in this mood, but he is speaking of God. He's speaking of God. So all that being said, all right, now let's look at these two verses. So I just read this, this uh, first verse that is here. Let's look through this. So first of all, O Govinda. Govinda is one of the names of Vishnu, of Narayana. It also is a name of Krishna, but primarily, and people don't know this, uh, many of the names ascribed to Krishna actually are names of Vishnu. They're in the Sri Vishnu Sahasranama, they're in other scriptures, and they're known to be primar primarily names of Vishnu. Though, of course, we know that also he is very specifically addressing Krishna, because he was a Krishna Bhakta, Krishna was his Ishta Devata, so that is absolutely known. So, O Govinda. Now, he says, feeling your separation. Now, let me stop here for a moment, and now I need to make another general comment if we are to understand these two verses in a way that maybe others have not really quite explained the depths of these verses the way I'm going to, to you now. In a way, with these two last verses, what Krish, what Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is expressing is, he is expressing his devotion. That is obvious when you read the verses. But more, he is addressing Krishna almost as if he is one of us. He is in separation from Krishna, he says. Really, he's not. Again, he's speaking on our behalf. So when we read these two verses, we have to understand that they apply to us also as beings who are in the material world, seemingly separated from God. So with this understanding, he first says, feeling your separation, i.e. feeling separated from God. Now, of course, we know that in actuality there is no separation, but we can have the illusion of separation. So Mahaprabhu here is speaking as if he is, again, a living being in the illusion of separation. As if. Of course, he's not. But again, he is uh, kind of speaking for us. So feeling your separation that I... I am separate from you now. I am considering a moment to be like 12 years or more. What is a moment? A moment is a fraction of a second. So every fraction of a second, when we are separated from God, we feel as if that fraction of a second <clears throat> is like 12 years. Now again, it's interesting. When we, when we hear something like this, 
this is also a symptom of being in love, is it not? When you're in love with somebody, and again, not just you love them, but you are in the throes of being in love with them. When you're separated from them, even a short period of time, it seems like forever, and you're counting the moments, you're thinking, oh, when will I be with, with them again? When will I be with them? And it seems like now suddenly time itself has miraculously stretched, <laughs> where instead of a minute, it seems like an hour, etc., etc. So this is what he's saying, but again, who is he saying this about? He's saying this about God, about Krishna, not just a human person he's in, he's in love with. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has always throughout his life been in love with only one person, and that is Krishna. So this is who he's speaking about. So I am considering a moment to be like 12 years or more. And now he goes on. Tears are flowing from my eyes like torrents of rain. Imagine this. Imagine this. And he, he means this both poetically because, you know, we have to say this. He wrote beautifully poetically. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's verses are, are perfect as far as literary form. He meant this both poetically but also literally. Because if you read about the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, um, he would often be in ecstatic mystic states in which, indeed, he tears would just come from his eyes profusely as he thought about Krishna and his separation from Krishna being here within, within this world. And indeed, there are many instances like this that were written about in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita and other biographies of his where indeed this is a mystic state that sometimes a shuddha bhakta, a pure devotee, will go through, where they will just think of Krishna and they will feel such, such, a, such a strong sense of being in love with Krishna, but also feeling that, that momentary separation to the point where uh, tears will just come to the eyes. And in the case of Mahaprabhu, uh, it was often miraculous how tears would just flow from his eyes. So when he's saying this, for him it was literal as well as poetic. So tears are flowing from my eyes like torrents of rain. So you can envision this, just like when it's raining, but it's not just raining a little bit, you know, it's raining hard and a lot to the point where you can barely even see through it. You try to peer through the rain, and it's almost like, like a curtain of rain. So this is what he's saying, is that this is often how he feels. And then, finally, and I am feeling all vacant in the world in your absence. Now, with this last sentence especially, let's back up again and let's plug in what I said just a moment ago about how Mahaprabhu, with these last two verses, is also speaking for us. In other words, unbeknownst to us even, that is, unbeknownst as far as why this is occurring, living beings ourselves will often feel vacant in this world. Do we not? We feel often alone. We feel lonely. We feel as if there is something missing from our lives. We can't quite put our finger on it. Some can. The more wise amongst us know that, oh yes, it's a spiritual vacancy. I need God in my life, and without God within this world, I just feel vacant, as Mahaprabhu says here. I just feel alone. I just feel as if there is something missing, and it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what entertainment I try to surround myself with. It doesn't matter what kind of so-called titillating pleasures I try to uh, give myself. It doesn't matter how high I get. It doesn't matter how much I drink. Nothing fulfills this feeling of vacancy that is there within us, this emptiness. So Mahaprabhu here, again, is speaking about all of us, what we are all experiencing. And then in this verse itself, of course, he explains why we are experiencing this, because that vacancy can only be filled with Krishna. It can only be filled with Krishna. You don't believe me? You don't have to believe me. Live your life. And you'll see. Whatever, again, whatever you do, you will always have a feeling of emptiness. If there were something in this material world that could stop that feeling of, of emptiness, it would. You would find it. <laughs> oh, there it is. The perfect food. I finally found it. It's the perfect fruit that is, is very, very, uh, very 
uh, rare to find. I have found it, and now I have everything that I need. All my life's ambitions and everything I've been searching for in my soul, in my being, is now fulfilled. Or that perfect song, or that perfect, and then fill in the blank. But you know you're not going to find this. You never have and you never will. Rather, what we are searching for indeed is Krishna. What we are searching for is God. And once we have God in our life, that feeling of vacancy is finally gone. This is why all beings search. This is why all beings, whatever they are, all living beings, all Atmans, and essentially, once and for all, to explain this, if there is a being who is alive, it is alive because it has Atman. So this means every ant, this means every plant, this means every, every insect, every animal, this means every god, every demon, this means every human. Every being who is alive, we're all searching, searching, searching to fill that vacancy, that emptiness that is there within us. And until we turn to God, we never find fulfillment. That's why we reincarnate and reincarnate and we reincarnate, because we are searching, searching, searching for Sri Krishna reality, the beautiful. My one of my primary gurus, Bhakti Rakshaka Sridhar Swami, had that very beautiful saying, Sri Krishna reality, the beautiful. He there is a book by him by that title, actually, and that is ultimately what we are searching for. That is what will fill the vacancy, and nothing else. Now let's go on to Shikshashtakam 8. And again, to repeat myself, <clears throat> another beautiful verse. And Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, I know no one but Krishna as my Lord, and he shall remain so even if he handles me roughly by his embrace, or makes me brokenhearted by not being present before me. He can freely do anything and everything, for he is always my worshipful Lord unconditionally. Beautiful verse, and much deeper than many of us can conceive. So we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at this verse and going very deeply into it. First of all, he says, <clears throat> I know no one but Krishna as my Lord. So indeed, this is the one-pointed devotional awareness, the true shuddha bhakti, pure devotion, that the Vaishnava, that the yogi, is to have, where, again, you are focused on God and on God alone. Now, in the case of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, indeed, the form of God that he worshipped, the form of Narayana, was Krishna. But the same thing can be said of Rama. I know no one but Rama as my Lord. Or it can be Narasimha, I know no one but Narasimha as my Lord. I know no one but Narayana as my Lord. Why can you say all these and it's the same? Because they're all Vishnu Tattva. Because they're all simply different names for that highest supreme personality of Godhead, Sriman Narayana. But in this case, indeed, again, Valmiki would have said Rama because he was a Rama Bhakta. In this case, it's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he is focused on Krishna. But ultimately, this is the thing that is of importance, is that what is he expressing with these words? Again, that one-pointed focus upon the Absolute, upon God, with devotion. Not upon other things, not divided attention, divided focus. Oh, I worship these three beings, these 29 beings, uh, this half being. <laughs> no, no, one being. I am focused upon God. So this is how we are to know God. This is how we are to know truth. This is how we are to practice spirituality, it is by focusing our awareness on one, the one Supreme Being. So I know no one but Krishna as my Lord. Now, after this, it gets to be very interesting, and I will have to explain this, probably in a, in a way that no one has before. He continues, and he shall remain so, that is, he shall remain my Lord, Krishna shall remain my Supreme Lord, who I focus all of my devotional awareness upon, even if he handles me roughly. Now let's stop there. Now again, keep this in mind. Now we have to plug in this information that I gave you before yet again. 
he is speaking certainly for himself, but more, he is speaking for us as the Atman who finds himself within this material world with all the uh, topsy-turvy, chaotic craziness, the ups and downs and the duality of this world, the suffering and the happiness and this roller coaster of both happiness and distress, happiness and distress, etc., etc. So this is why he is saying this. He shall remain so even if he handles me roughly. Now, does God ever handle us roughly in actuality? You better believe he does not. God has nothing but love for us. But being here situated within the material energy of God, of our own choosing, due to our own illusion, to, due to our own ego, we find ourselves, again, in this topsy-turvy, crazy world, we often feel as if, indeed, we are being handled roughly. And we are. We are being handled roughly by our own karma, by our own doing, by our own choices. So, yes, we find ourselves in a material world where one day we're elated and we're happy, something great has happened. The next day we're almost in depression, oh, something terrible has happened. And then within the scope of 24 hours we can experience this roller coaster of up and down, up and down. I'm happy, I'm depressed, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm this, I'm that, etc., etc. So indeed, this material world itself treats us roughly. This material world being a manifestation in form and name of one of the energies, i.e. Prakriti of Sriman Narayana. So this is what he's saying, in a way, it's kind of an interesting, kind of a wink to God, saying that, even if I am treated roughly in this world, which I know is your creation, but the roughness of which is my doing due to my karma, still I know that you are there behind the scenes, loving me, and just waiting for me to realize you, and to love you in turn. So again, he is speaking as the Atman within this material world, in indeed this rough place. So, he shall remain so even if he handles me roughly, and I had stopped there, and now I go on, by his embrace. So it's very important to understand that we are to ultimately have the realization that when we are within this material world, things that come to us, whether seemingly good or seemingly bad, are ultimately all the grace and the mercy of God. I've spoken about this before. <clears throat> My guru spoke about this endlessly, and many other gurus have as well. How the environment, the world around us, is not our enemy. It's our friend. Even when it seems that, again, there are ups and downs, ups and downs, and it seems sometimes like the whole world is against us. Oh, my Lord, what's happening? You have one of those days where you have just a, a streak, a succession of bad things just kind of hit you and hit you and hit you. And you start to think, oh, my Lord, the world is against me. No. In actuality, if we have the vision to see this, we understand that rather than strikes against us by our environment, if we look past that environment itself, as devotees of Bhagavan Sri Krishna, if we look with eyes of love, we understand that ultimately even that, even the so-called negative things that happen to us, are nothing but the loving embrace of God, there to teach us, there to make us stronger, there to purify us. So the Vaishnava, the true devotee of God, we thank God even for whatever pain comes our way. We fall ill someday, and whatever, for two weeks or so, you know, we have the flu or something like this, or, oh, we stumble and, oh, we kind of hurt ourselves or something like this. Rather than cursing the universe around us, the Vaishnava actually thanks God for what occurs to him, good or bad, understanding that ultimately it's my karma and it's there to teach me, but also, ultimately, again, it is God's embrace toward us. If we have the proper vision, even painful things that happen to us, even challenging things that happen to us, again, they will make us stronger. They will make us more disciplined. They will make us more aware. They will make us more grateful. More grateful, more aware of the nature of the world that we are in. Again, we become educated by all things that happen to us, good or bad. And more than this, 
we develop the faith to understand that behind all things, ultimately, there is God's loving embrace that is there. When we develop this vision, when we truly develop this vision and this devotional attitude toward God, it's not that bad things will stop happening to us. I've said this a million times. Even the rishi, even the sage walking through a forest might uh, stub his toe on, a, on a, a large root, not seeing it, a tree root or something, or a big rock. Bad things will still happen once in a while, but this is the difference. The common person gets angry. The common person, again, blames the world. The saintly person is detached and realizes all things that happen to me, it's simply Krishna playing with me out of love. That's all that it is. It's just Krishna playing with me out of love. So thus embracing me. God is always embracing us. It's just a matter of, why aren't you seeing that? Very good. Or makes me brokenhearted by not being present before me. Again, this goes back to what we were saying before with the previous verse. <clears throat> How in our illusion, we think that God is not present before us. This is why the atheist, the little childish, immature, petulant little atheist, will, in their squeaky little voice, <laughs> ask the question, Where's God? Where's God? I don't see a God. Where's God? Is he in the sky? Let me send a rocket up and see if I can find God up there, etc. Um, we have the illusion that we're alone. We have the illusion that God is not present before us. Not understanding that, no, actually at all times God is present before us. And when we have that illusion that we are bereft of God's presence, that is when our heart is broken. That is when we experience the sufferings of this world. Not understanding that, indeed, God is always here. God is present at all times, within all things. And indeed, when we develop Krishna consciousness, you know, you've heard this term before. This was the term, beautiful term, that Prabhupada used, Krishna consciousness. Oh, we want Krishna consciousness. That is the goal of the ISDS. That is the goal of all legitimate Vaishnava Dharma, is to develop Krishna consciousness. And what does this mean? This means that we understand at all times that we are never separated from Krishna, that Krishna is in all things, present all around us, and that it's merely an illusion to think that there is an actual separation between ourselves and Krishna. To understand that in actuality, Krishna is here. And why do we not, quote-unquote, see him? Why do we not experience him? It's not because of Krishna, it's because of us. It's not because Krishna does not desire for us to experience him at this present moment or at any given time. It's because we may say that we want to experience God, again, just like the atheist. You think the atheist really means it? When he says, oh, show me God. If he were to see God, he would die of a heart attack on the spot. The atheist doesn't mean it. In the same way, many of us, we may say, oh, I want to see God. But if we truly want to, then we have to develop, we have to cultivate that darshana, that vision of God through bhakti. Indeed, we have the ability to see God, not with these eyes, not with these senses, but rather within, internally, in our hridaya, in our heart. We can experience the presence of Krishna all around us at all times. Indeed, God is present within every single atom in existence there's a microphone before me. God is within every single atom of this microphone. God is within my own body, every single atom of every single cell of my body, etc., etc. How do we not just know this theoretically? How do we experience this? We cultivate an awareness of Krishna. We purify ourselves in such a way that indeed we have Krishna consciousness. We can be aware of God, of Krishna, at all times, 24 hours a day. doesn't mean that we go into some sort of silly trance where we can no longer interact with the world. No, that's not what we're saying. On the contrary, I've said this many times. You look at the perfected rishis. They did things in the world. Sometimes they were advisors to kings and rulers of empires. They wrote books. They did mathematics. Many of them were scientists, etc., etc. They had families. Most of the rishis were married and had children, etc. 
but they were in samadhi, they were focused upon Krishna at all times while doing within this world. So again, how do we come to this? We come to this by practice, by practicing, by reciting. Now getting back to the earlier verses of Shikshashtakam, you see we're keeping this all self-contained by meditating upon the holy names of God with humility thinking ourselves lower than a straw in the street, etc. This is how we come to this Krishna consciousness. And now finally, let's look at the last sentence of this. He can freely do anything and everything, for he is always my worshipful Lord unconditionally. What is this? What is this last sentence? We know what this is. We've heard this before. Now in this exact wording, this is prapatti. This is what it means to be fully self-surrendered unto God, that this is the attitude that we have. God, I, and when I say I, I mean everything that I am on every single level down to the deepest essential core of my being. I am yours, and I am yours unconditionally, i.e., no matter what. I am yours, and yours alone, and you may do with me what you wish. I am yours, no matter what. This is what Mahaprabhu is saying here. So let's go through this. He can freely do anything and everything. So again, at this point, the pure Vaishnava relinquishes who he is at the feet of God. And there are no conditions. There is no, oh God, I am yours, uh, except uh, if you want me to do this, or with this condition or that condition. I'm yours, um, except for these clauses, uh, clause uh, 3A uh, to, 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 uh, to D. <laughs> no, we don't negotiate with God. Rather, what, what surrender, what prapatti means is what Mahaprabhu is saying here. He can freely do anything and everything with me. This is what Mahaprabhu is saying. This is pure surrender. We want to understand what is prapatti, what is this sharanagati. There are many different words for this. Atmanivedana. Atmanivedana. These, all these words mean the same thing. Surrender of oneself wholly and unconditionally at the feet of God. You, under, you want to understand what this means? There are certain verses in the Vedic scriptures, including here. This is not a Vedic scripture, but it might as well be because it's the words of a shuddha bhakta, a pure devotee. Here in the Bhagavad Gita, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in many Vedic scriptures, there are actual passages that explain what is meant by surrender unto God. This is one of them. He can freely do anything and everything with me, for he is always my worshipful Lord. Let's focus on this now. <clears throat> Perpetuity. Perpetuity is one of the aspects of what it means to be truly and seriously a spiritual person. No change, no fads, no, oh, I like this today, oh, I don't like it tomorrow. This is the hallmark of what it means to be a self-cheater. This is why, again, I will, I will have to mention this until they finally truly go away once and for all. You see, New Age people are the opposite of perpetuity. New Age people are, oh, whatever strikes my fancy spiritually today, that's what I'll do. Oh, let me chant this mantra. Oh, I'm tired of that. Let me try this. Oh, I'm, try I'm tired of that. Let me go to this seminar. Oh, you know, that, that guy was all right. Uh, I, I, I accepted half of what he said. Let me do this. Let me. And no idea of being solid like a rock, of devotion, of devoting yourself. To devote yourself means you don't change your mind if you are devoted. To be devoted means that you love and you love forever, eternally. So he says, for he is always, not just today, not just for the moment, you know, again, until something else strikes my fancy, quote-unquote spiritually. No, he is always my worshipful Lord. And how? Unconditionally. Doesn't matter the conditions. Doesn't matter what in his service I must go through. In his service, sometimes I'm having wonderful days when things are great and going along smoothly and harmoniously and everything is blissful. But then there are some days when 
oh, I'm, in, I'm doing things in his service, and it seems like, oh, no matter what I do today, I just get pushback and pushback and pushback from ignorant people. Doesn't matter. I am in his service, in his service alone, regardless of anything. And nothing will stop me. Nothing will change my mind. I am an, I am un, an unstoppable being in his service. And eternally so. This is the attitude of the Vaishnava, and this is what it means to surrender unto God unconditionally, without conditions. This is what our attitude must be if we are to know God fully and thoroughly and with devotion. Very good. So here we are at the end, the end of Shikshashtakam, verse 8. And I have gotten a lot of feedback, not just in the chat, but also many other venues, that uh, people have truly enjoyed the last three sessions where we have gone through all eight verses of the Shikshashtakam. And uh, trust me, it has nothing to do with my presentation of it. It has to do with the fact that that's how powerful these verses are. You hear these verses and then have them properly explained to you. They are powerful. They are truly powerful. You can meditate upon these verses, contemplate these verses very humbly, very calmly for a very, very long time. And your understanding will deepen and deepen and deepen, not just of the verses themselves, but more importantly, of what the verses are trying to convey to us. And that is how to fully surrender ourselves and be in love with God. Very good. So with that, we will stop here. Thank you very much for listening to my discourse over the last three sessions on the Shikshashtakam. And with that, I will signal to everyone that now if you have any questions, either about what we've discussed today or any aspect of Sanatana Dharma, if you have any sincere questions, please feel free to ask, and it would be my pleasure to answer any questions that you have. I see a lot of, as has been the case, <laughs> many, many, many good, uh, good comments that are here. Very good. Om Namo Narayanaya. Very, very good. Very good question here. Namaste Sri Acharyaji. If Sriman Narayana is present within our heart as Paramatman, is it true that Vaikuntha is also there in our heart as his abode? Yes. It is indeed true. It is indeed true. This is something that is very esoteric. Sadly, too deep to go into now, but let me just say that uh, Sriman Narayana and Vaikuntha are indeed inseparable inseparable. Where there is Vaikuntha, you can can you imagine Vaikuntha and Narayana is not there? and <laughs> Not possible. Um, but also vice versa as well, because even Vaikuntha itself uh, is a manifestation of uh, the inner essence of Narayana. That being the case, wherever Narayana is, whether uh, it can be, let's say, quote-unquote, seen by individuals or not, it doesn't matter. Vaikuntha is also there with him because he is Vaikuntha itself. So, indeed, to answer your question, the answer is yes. Mm. Very good. Here is a, another very good question from Dharmachari, and it is Namaste Sri Acharyaji. We understand that devotion is not emotion, but does this verse indicate that devotion can generate emotion as a kind of downstream? byproduct of intense devotional experience. Excellent question, actually. I know exactly what you're asking, and let me answer it in, in this way to be exact. No. No. Devotion does not produce emotion in the material sense, but rather true spiritual emotion, which is something that is radically different. So emotion, uh, emotion is something that is... Uh, uh, 
Abhitapa. Abhitapa is emotion. It's something that is materially oriented. It's situated as far as its ontological level in between, uh, in between body and mind. And I can go deeply into why that's the case, but just accept that for now. But it is something that's material. <clears throat> now, of necessity, even in this, in this translation, you'll sometimes see that, oh, feelings are discussed, etc. What is being discussed here is not abhitapa, that is, uh, that phenomenon known as emotion that is actually materially based, and thus that is ephemeral in nature. That's like a fog, that's like a ghost, that's like a shadow that you can't really grab onto, that seems to have a form, but in, actual, in, in actuality does not. That's emotion in the material sense. Rather, what is, and you described it very nicely here, what is a, a downstream byproduct of intense emotion, devotional experience, is not emotion in the material sense, uh, but rather manifestations of devotion that are experienced variously in accordance with both the personality, uh, who, the personality being spoken of, and what is occurring at the time. So in other words, devotion does indeed express itself in different ways that spiritually might be expressed as feeling or emotion, but it's not the same as abhitapa. You know, it's not the same as, as material feeling, but rather these are manifestations of devotion. These are bhakti rasas, bhakti rasas. These are mellows and moods of devotion itself, which inherently are spiritual fully spiritual. So I hope that makes sense. So there's that distinction that's there between, again, uh, absolutely pure spiritual manifestations of devotion that come about as, as a result of devotion that are spiritual in, the, in and of themselves, as far as mood, mellow, rasa, etc., versus material devotion. So I hope that that makes sense. Very good. And here is uh, Jesse saying, thank you, Acharya My pleasure. Namaste, Jesse. Good to see you. Good. Here is a, a good question from Berserker. Do single cell organisms have Atman? <clears throat> they seem to exhibit seeking behavior seeking nutrition and avoiding danger. Do those traits alone qualify uh, free will, or am I misunderstanding things? No, you're not misunderstanding, actually. At the same time, to answer this with exactitude, uh, not those traits alone, but those traits among other traits do indeed show that you're dealing with a living entity versus an entity that is not, and any living entity uh, by default is a living entity because it has Atman. There is no such thing. This is a, this is a confused, um, let's say, um, Abrahamic sort of idea that you can have somehow living beings that don't have a soul. Uh, no, no ancient culture, no pre-Abrahamic ancient culture would agree with this. They all understood, whether you're talking about pre-Christian European religion or uh, the more ancient forms of Zoroastrianism or certainly Vedic, etc., etc., etc. They all understood that, that life equals Atman. Atman equals life. You see something that is alive, it is alive because it has Atman, because it has consciousness, therefore it is sentient and not insentient. This is true also for single-cell organisms. Indeed, they display all of the attributes of a being who has Atman. Therefore, logically, it can be inferred that, of course, they do indeed have Atman. So, yes, single-cell or organisms are alive, they have Atman. That, of course, leads to a, a secondary thing, which is why sometimes... The only reason why it's difficult for some people to accept this, that indeed every, even single-cell organisms have Atmans. The only reason, really, really, psychologically, why it's difficult for some people to accept this is because we know there are so many of them. They are innumerable. So for some people, they think there's a numerical limit to how many Atmans there are. There are, And they can't believe that there can actually be that many Atmans in existence. Again, that's the, the only drawback that some people have in accepting this. 
Uh, no, there are that many Atmans. There are an infinite number of Atmans in existence. And infinite means infinite, not infinite up to this barrier, up to this degree. Infinite means infinite. So I hope that answers the question. Good question. <clears throat> Very good. Very good. All right. Uh, this is a very good question from Vedic Hartland. First, he says, Namaskar Acharyaji. You have a, a way of explaining things so clearly. Thank you for saying so. What is the difference between Shankaracharya's Advaita and Vishnu Swami's, uh, that is also Vallabha's uh, as well, uh, Shuddha Advaita? Uh, thank you. And Sanatana Dharma Jayate. Yes, unfortunately, <clears throat> I've had uh, some questions from people who really don't understand, truly don't understand even the fundamentals of the difference between the two, and they somehow think that Vishnu Swami and Vallabha Acharya, who is the latest, most imp uh, the latest important Acharya in this in this uh, Rudra lineage, that Shuddha Advaita somehow is the exact same thing as Shankara's Advaita. They're not in any way, shape, or form, actually, despite the fact that you have Advaita in the title of this Vedantic system. So, for example, the Vedantic system that I follow is called Vishishta Advaita. You see, you also have the term Advaita there. Simply because you have the term Advaita uh, within the construct of a philosophical term does not mean that it necessarily has anything to do with Shankara. The, the term Advaita is simply a philosophical term. It simply uh, means not to. <laughs> That's literally what it means. It means non-dual. Now, all, uh, all Vaishnavas believe in non-dualism in the sense of there being ultimately one supreme being, ultimately one ontological real that is of ultimate value in that every other ontological real proceeds from that one that one ontological real. So this is why even personalistic Vaishnavas will, in a sense, call themselves Advaitins, but again, not just Advaitins, Vishishta Advaitins, Shuddha Advaitins, etc. So thus, we believe in the oneness of God. We believe that ultimately all things, including even Atman, including even Prakriti, uh, ultimately have their source in God on the one hand, but then on the other hand, and this is true for Vishishta Advaitins as well as Shuddha Advaitins. Uh, we are personalists, i.e., we believe that ultimately God is not merely an impersonal force, but that God is a personality with everything uh, that that means philosophically and spiritually. That is not a persona, not a limited and flawed personality, the likes of which we see among humans, but a personality meaning a being who indeed has free will, has desires, has distinct uh, essential attributes, and thus identity. So thus, indeed, all Vaishnavas, including uh, Vishnu Swami and Shuddha Advaita, accept this, that God is a person. That's the first thing. Second thing, there is indeed the distinction of what are called the Tri Tattvas, uh, all, Vedantas, all Vedantists accept the three tattvas, that is, that the ultimate reals are Brahman, that is God, Atman, individual souls, and Prakriti, or materiality. The only difference being, what is the relationship between the three? See, all Vedantists, both impersonalists and personalists, accept these three tattvas, these three reals. The difference being that for the Advaitins, the only one that is truly real is Brahman, the other two, i.e. individual Atman and Prakriti, Jagat, materiality, are a thorough illusion. That's what the Advaitins say. But for the, again, Shuddha Advaitins, Vishishta Advaitins, etc., no, we accept that these, three, that these three are real, but having their basis in Brahman, they also are one in that they are manifestations of God's energy. You see? So I can go much, much deeper, but indeed, uh, Shuddha Advaita is the uh, philosophical system of, as you mentioned, Vishnu Swami, but also Vallabha Acharya, 
uh, both of who were perfect Vaishnavas in every sense of the term. They were not followers of Advaita in the Shankara sense of that term at all. All right, Berserker has a uh, second part to his question. If they, and I assume you're still speaking about one cell organisms, if they do have Atman, and if our body is comprised of cells, does that mean that there are many Atmans, different from ourselves, operating in the world of our body? Yes. <laughs> yes, that is indeed the case. In fact, you know, we don't even have to go down to the minutest detail of cells. We know that um, you know, and you know, of course I'm not a biologist, but I know enough about the human body to know that there are many, 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 many different living beings who are operating within our body. You know, there are beings living inside our body. There are beings, you know, <laughs> just all throughout our, our body. This goes down to the point of indeed even cells. So indeed, we are a one Atman who is in control of this one body that is comprised of many other Atmans who also are here as well. So in a way, we are kind of a self-contained universe. And this indeed is what is, there's even a philosophical term for this uh, in Sanskrit. It's the, the, the mandala principle. That is the idea that our entire cosmos consists of self-contained units within self-contained units within self-contained units, mandalas of ever-increasing proportion and size to the point where the cosmos itself, i.e. our specific universe, our Brahmanda, is itself a self-contained unit. So indeed, our body is itself kind of a mini-universe. So uh, the hermetic principle, as above, so below. Indeed, we have many mandalas, many self-contained universes, of which our body is one. And indeed, there are many smaller Atmans that are attached to our physical frame. Very good. I hope that answers that question. <clears throat> Very good. Oh, I'm just looking at the time now. We're actually past we're a little bit past uh, the hour, but still I see a question here that I am going to answer because it's an important one, actually. It's a very practical, very relevant one to our very age itself. And this is from Sutta Veda Healing, and it's in two parts. Sri Acharya will you speak to those people who may be new agey and not want to commit to practices because in the past... They have been taken advantage of and abused in the name of being committed to a certain teacher, cults, religious organizations in general, etc. Uh, thank you. Very good. Yes, this is something that I, I, I can and would like to address, actually. And indeed, this is one of the pitfalls and frustrations of our very age itself, of the Kali Yuga, of the fact that we are living in an age of the cheaters and the cheated. It's a very sad thing to me personally. There is nothing sadder. Abuse itself is a very is a horrible thing. It's a horrific thing. <clears throat> Whatever kind of abuse we're talking about, physical, sexual, emotional, etc., etc. But one of the first, one of the worst kinds of abuses that there is is indeed spiritual abuse, and that is when you have individuals who portray themselves as knowledgeable persons in spirituality persons who have very deep, very high uh, realizations, etc., etc., but then who use that, who are, first of all, who are lying about that. They don't actually have knowledge. They're actually internally not very advanced beings at all, maybe the opposite. And they use that to abuse others. Yes, this is something that I've seen all my life. It's some, something that many people have seen. And indeed, uh, sometimes this is why people will turn to a more new agey sort of approach the thing that's interesting, of course, is that it is very specifically, especially within the New Age milieu, that you find these people the most, actually. Uh, you find, let's say, religious cheaters everywhere. Oh, you find them in traditional religion. You'll find them in all the denominations. You'll find them in the so-called world religions, which is kind of a misnomer. I never use that term for reasons that we can talk about later. 
But you find abusers everywhere today. Indeed, you find abusers in politics. You find abusers, God knows, in business. You find abusers everywhere. Um, but now getting back to religion and spirituality, of course, the place where they do congregate religiously more than any place is indeed within the New Age milieu where it tends to even be the case that most New Age so-called spiritual teachers will have businesses, outright businesses. They don't even hide it. They'll have LLCs. They don't have nonprofits. They don't have religious organizations, spiritual organizations, actual charitable organizations, etc. They literally will have businesses established and incorporated. So it tends to be within, uh, within New Age circles that you find the most teachers. So this is the first thing that I would say. As far as a person turning to New Age spirituality because they're trying to avoid cheaters, well, you've just thrown yourself into the cesspool of, of cheaters because this is where, indeed, all of the everything is set up within the New Age milieu in such a way that the cheaters can, uh, can operate the best. That being the case, that is one reason to get away from uh, from New Age circles, and to instead seek spirituality in more traditional forms. Seek spirituality, indeed, in ancient traditions, real ancient traditions, not going back uh, 200 years, <laughs> not a, not a so-called lineage that goes back to the 19th century. No, meaning turn to the truly ancient religions, and I'll state this very generally. Yes, turn to Buddhism if you want to, turn to Taoism, Turn absolutely to Vedic spirituality. But this is the first thing. Throw away anything modern, anything concocted, anything that came about because of a book that was written 20 years ago, even 50 years ago. But rather go to those traditions that have been here for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. Because you keep stumbling upon what is called fool's gold, you know, there's a, a type of rock that you can find that looks just like real gold, but then you pick it up and it's very light. And if you bring it to some place in a very excited way where they know gold and you say, look at this, I found gold, they'll just laugh at you. Uh, no, it looks like gold, but it's not. Well, you may have found fool's gold multiple times. Does that mean there is no real gold in the world? Of course not. That's not a logical conclusion. Indeed, the very reason why you got excited about the fool's gold is because you know that there is such a thing as real gold. And indeed, you simply mistaked the two. So this is an unfortunate thing that happens with some people who have been cheated by fake spiritual teachers, is that they will then, in frustration, throw their hands up in the air and say, well, I got cheated two, three times, that must mean that there are no legitimate spiritual teachers. That must mean there is no legitimate spiritual tradition, etc. There is no legitimate spiritual scripture. Oh, but I still want to, despite the fact of my hurt, I still want to practice some form of spirituality. Now let me just make things up as I go along, because at least that's safe. Seemingly safe in our own mind. Truthfully, it's not. Because now we will stumble into other crevices and holes because we thought it was safe to just make it up as we go along. That's about as safe as doing surgery on yourself. <laughs> Not safe at all, actually. But again, it's understandable how some people will become cynical. Well, in the same way that, oh, you found this fool's gold, look like gold, but it's not several times, oh, it would be foolish to say, well, then real gold doesn't exist. No, in the same way, there are legitimate spiritual teachers. We know that they have existed all throughout history. We know this. Otherwise, there would be no spirituality. If we were to throw out every single spiritual teacher for going back thousands of years, throw out Jesus, throw out the Buddha, throw out the Rishis, throw them all out, we would not even have spirituality at all in existence today. No, there are legitimate spiritual teachers. We know they've been there in the past. They must be here today. See, let me explain this. For people who say, well, that's the past. Oh, but today is today. Well, where are the real spiritual teachers today? If it were not possible for a person to actually become liberated in 2022, if there, in other words, are no actual legitimate spiritual teachers, i.e., 
people who themselves have achieved truth in their lives, why are you even on the spiritual path? If then by default it's something that you cannot achieve. See, if you say there are no liberated beings today, there are no legitimate spiritual teachers, that means you can't become liberated either. Why are you even bothering them? No. There are legitimate spiritual teachers today. And the fact that you may have stumbled across some cheaters, oh, you, you have my deepest sympathy. I spend half my time speaking out against the cheaters. I know they're out there as much as anyone. And I know that they need to be stopped more than anyone, actually. But again, please don't allow the fact that you were cheated yourself to now be a reason to cheat yourself. See, you've been cheated. Now, if you throw your hands up in the air and say, well, I guess there are no legitimate spiritual teachers, now you're cheating yourself, because there are. There are. And how do you find these spiritual teachers? You have faith and you never give up. You have faith and you never give up. Again, I'll use this as a, as a, a semi-example. You know, a gold prospector. Let's say a person is a gold prospector. And they go up into some high mountains where it's been rumored that there's gold there. And they're very poor and they work very hard. And they just want to find some gold so they don't have to live in poverty for the rest of their lives. And again, they find that fool's gold. Nope, looks like gold, but it's not. Oh, another one looks like gold, but it's not. What is that person to do? First of all, they are, they are to have faith that they know gold does exist. People sell it every day. People find it. There is gold. And B, I will never find it if I give up. That's guaranteed. That's guaranteed. So what is that person looking for the gold? What do they do? They continue and they continue and they continue. And eventually they'll find that gold. In the same way, we as spiritual people, we may have been cheated before. We may have come across individuals who pose themselves as these great spiritual wise individuals who are going to guide us in every aspect of our life. And they were just absolute rancid liars. We have faith that we know what we're looking for. We're looking for the real. And we also have faith that God will reciprocate that faith. That when God sees that we have that faith, what is that saying? When you are ready, the Guru will come. The Guru will be revealed to you when you are ready. How are you ready? You don't give up. You show God that you have that faith, and God then reciprocates. This is the nature of the grace of God. People talk about this all the time. Oh, grace of God, grace, grace. This is what the grace of God means, is that we, first of all, we don't give up on God. We don't give up on our search. doesn't matter if we've been cheated. doesn't matter if, oh, we tried this technique only to discover it was made up by some idiot 20 years ago. It's not something based in reality, not something based on an actual tradition. All right, well, we keep looking, and you keep looking. And you look with sincerity, and you look with faith, and you look with devotion, because you know what you want. What do you want? What do you want? That's the other thing. If you truly want the highest, and you yourself don't want to play games, you don't want to just have, oh, mystical experiences, little natural spiritual highs. No. No, not childish spirituality. If you want to know the highest, that which is the source of all reality. And if you have that faith and you have that determination and you have devotion toward that, even if as of right now you haven't quite found a legitimate teacher to fully reveal this to you, still you have that faith that that's what you want. You want God. God will see this and he will reciprocate. And that is grace. And a true teacher a true spiritual teacher who's not going to lie to you, who's not going to cheat you, who's not after your money, that person will be revealed to you. Now this is the next thing. When that person is revealed to you, will you be ready?
So with that, we will end here. It's 8.16 Vedic Heartland time. And I thank you all very much for being here. Please join us again next time that we get together. We try to get together Mondays. Sometimes we can't. The last time it was because of the, uh, because of the uh, conference that was going on. Like I said, people were still here till Wednesday, actually, till, uh, till today, just leaving this morning. So we were very busy. But please join us again, hopefully next Monday. And in the meantime, please take these verses that you now have of the Shikshashtakam, contemplate them, and make them come alive in your life. With that, Namaste. Jaya Sriman Narayana. Jaya Bhagavan Shri Krishna Jaya Shri Guru Sanatana Dharma Jayate Dharma Rashtra Jayate Suravansha Jayate International Sanatana Dharma Society Jayate Vedic Heartland Jayate Om Hari And with that, everyone, until the next time that we get together, I ask you all that in every way you please Take very good care of yourselves.